Okay, welcome up back everybody, for those of you still learning during summer vacation. So um, we're going to continue, uh, just a quick announcement about the next coming shiurim. Uh, we looked at, I was Rabbi, with Rabbi Kevin, I was looking at the calendar, and um, there's going to be about five weeks due to Yom Tovim that there's no Sunday class. Because it's either Erev Rosh Hashanah or Rosh Hashanah or Erev Yom Kippur or Sukkot or some class starts. So it's like five weeks in a row that Sundays there's no learning. I mean, there's holidays. So uh, we decided, and Elo will be an Elo topic. So therefore, we're going to do, um, we're not going to really get into Sefer Shmuel until after the Chagim. And everything up until then, today will still be, this week and next week will still be Sefer Shmuel, but very general topics. And the book itself we'll get to after the Chagim in Hashem. That was one word of introduction, and now we're going to get to work. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay, uh, there we go. So today, Early Prophets, One Book or One Theme, Class 14, Sefer Shmuel, etc. And today's topic, the transition from Shoftim to Shmuel, which we've already talked about. But today, in light of Tilim 106 and 107, and maybe even 78, I'll explain the reason. The reason is simple. Um, because Sefer Tilim, as we'll see again very soon, uh, began during the time period of King David. Now, it continues even through uh, maybe early Second Temple period, but the basic concept of the Book of Tilim and the Mizmorim, the Psalms that King David himself wrote or commissioned, surely reflect this time period. We'll see that for sure today. And therefore, if we want to get some insight of this time period from a different angle, it makes sense that in, in Sefer Tilim, we'll be able to find some insights to appreciate the time period of the Navi Shmuel, and especially tr the transition from Sefer Shmuel to Sefer Shoftim. I'm going to share my screen real fast, and I need to turn on my air conditioner. One second. Okay. Um, let me just open something up here. Already. Okay, now we get to work. Um, so my first source, basically, I want to begin. I just want to make sure everyone hears me okay. Just give me a thumbs up real fast. Yes. Sounds good. Okay. And turn off my phone. Okay. That's good. Okay. Um, I want to begin this quickly. In Dibri Amim, Sukim, we saw uh, last week, but from a different angle. There we use these sukim to identify Shmuel as a as a Levite and a great grandson, a great great grandson of Korach. I want to go back to those same that same parak and show you how Tilim is from the, from that time period. So again, in Dibra Yamim, uh, Aleph chapter six, Ela Sher Mi David Aide Sher Beit Hashem Mimenoch Haron from the time the Aron came and found its resting place in Yerushalayim that was facilitated by King David. It's a big story in Sefer Shmuel. We'll see. And therefore, these are um, the people that David and Melech commissioned and the choir who began during his time period. David, even though the temple wasn't built yet, David brought the Aron to Yerushalayim, he made a choir in Yerushalayim. And the beginning of Sefer Tilim, the Meshorim, the Meshartim, the people singing and giving the people guidance in, the, in, the, in, the, in Yerushalayim, in the capital city, the center was the Aron until the temple was built. And David appointed um, Elam Dim from the Pebnekat Heman, the grandson of Shmuel the prophet. That's what we talked about last week. And Asaf, as we'll see today, also a chief Levite. And Mizmori Mori Asaf, we're gonna, that we have on Tuesday morning. Asaf is very common in Tilim, especially from book three onward. Um, so he was also appointed by King David. In fact, he was commissioned, we'll see in a minute, in chapter 16 in Dibram Aleph, when they brought the Aron, so again, David, in order to get the nation back on its feet and fulfill their goal, um, one of the things that David did, not just to unite the country and build a strong central government and organize all the tribes together, he wanted to make sure that the country fulfilled its prophetic goal and therefore to guide the people in this national center, he's going to have a choir. They're going to compose Tilim, and Tilim, we'll see, will be guidance. There'll be, it'll be rebuke, Musar, will be praising God. But that way, we're going to find many core themes of Chumash that we find um, 
reflected in Sefer and Sefer Tehilim. We'll see in the beginning of the time of King David. And I want to go back to my key point that I mentioned at the beginning. If I look at Jewish history from the time period of leaving Egypt, uh, we sort of reach a first high point in the time period of Yeshua. We conquered the land and divided up to the tribes. But soon after that, as we saw in Sefer Yeshua, things fall apart. Uh, the country does definitely not fulfill its goal. And during the time of the Shoftim, things go from bad to worse. And by the time the Sefer Shoftim is over, we find a terrible society. We found those stories at the end of the book we talked about a lot. We find Shoftim that are nothing to brag about, like Yiftach and Shimshon and, and the story with Abimelech, etc. And basically, leadership has fallen apart. The country has gone to idol worship. Even the service of God has gone haywire pretty much. And things, again, reach rock bottom. Um, security-wise as well, the Plishtim or the new arch enemy have infiltrated the coastal plain and the lowlands are infiltrating even the mountain ranges, we'll see. Uh, we'll talk about the geography next week, Shir. And within 30, 40 years, we go from rock bottom to a point which never been as good before in the time of King David and then the early years of King Solomon. So what was the turnaround event? We'll see. It'll be the prayer of Hana. It'll be the work of Shmuel. There's a renaissance. There's a, a return. We're finally getting the Jewish people back on track. And one of the key things that David is doing to make sure they stay on track is to compose Tehillim in our national center. So again, so that was, we had Haman, the grandson of Shmuel. And now Asaf, who's the head Levite, as we see here, his name is Charia. We have all this, the people, um, a list of their instruments, and Benayahu, etc. always in front of the Aaron, again, representing the covenant between God and his people. Then we're told, um, I'm sorry, get my mouse up here. This we talked about last week. And then we have the famous prayer that we say every name in, in Psukhari Zimra, we quote from chapter 16 in Divraimim Aleph. If we have time, maybe we'll go back to that in a later shir and see how important that prayer will be as well. What I want to begin with today. It's TD 106. Again, uh, maybe I'll open up a talk real fast. TD 105, 106, and 107 form a group. There's a theme that they match each other beautifully. Let me just check the, I'll share the source sheet one more time. Okay. I just posted the source sheet once more for those who came in late. Um, TD 105, 106, and 107 all sh share a common theme of praising God. Um, the famous one, 105, which we don't um, quote verbatim, but it's quoted in Divra Yamim, and we basically say most of it um, every morning. I'm going to share my screen and open up a regular book of Tehillim. If I open up Tehillim, not 78, we want Tehillim 105. One second. Okay. Tehillim 105 is famous. Hodu Hashem Kirubishmo. It's a command that Tehillim is saying. We, as descendants of Avram Avinu, um, who called out in God's name, a nation chosen by God to make a name for God. So we're commanded to recognize God, to acknowledge God, to thank him, call out in his name, tell the nations about him, primarily about how we act and how we talk, how we behave, sing his praises, Shuru lo uh, talk about him all the time, um, remember all the great things he did, and who's being commanded, Pasuk Vav, Zerah Avram Abdo B'nei Therefore, the offspring of Avram Avinu, the children of Yaakov, who's chosen by God to become his people, um, it's our obligation, according to Tilim, to sing God's praises and call out in his name. So again, um, in chapter 105, which we're not doing today, we go back, we're thanking God for fulfilling Brit Ben of Tarim. Uh, we say, remember, we, we thank God that he remembered his covenant, the one he made with Avram, his second Yaakov, and then we go to the story of Yitzhak Mitzrayim. So that's all the good things that God did for us and how God fulfilled his part of the covenant. Tidim 106, as we're going to read very soon, is going to be the flip side of it, uh, how bad we were. So I'm going to now share my, go back to the source sheet, and I want to show you in Tidim 106, in contrast to 105, that even though 105 claims that we're obligated to sing out God's praises, Tidim 106 makes a similar statement and then has a caveat. So let's take a quick look and we'll see how we relate to our Sefer Shmuel. So let's look at the opening lines of 106, and then we'll get to the closing lines. Okay. Hallelujah. Hodu Hashem Kitov Kilo Lam Chazdo. That's nothing new. That's almost a refrain throughout Tilim, and we saw something very similar 
and 105. So we're told it's our obligation to recognize God, to acknowledge God, his kindness is forever. Now, Tini 105 talked about it's our obligation, it's our covenantal obligation to sing God's praises and recognize his hand in our history and thank him for fulfilling his covenant. But even though we're obligated to sing God's praises, we ask an important question, who's worthy of singing God's praises? Who's, willing, who's worthy of being able to praise God? And the same question, who's worthy of making his praise heard? Then the Mizmor answer is, we might have an obligation to sing God's praises, but only people who do mishpat and slaka, that's the second, that's the second major theme of Sefer Breshit. That was the underlying reason why God was, why Abram was chosen. So we see in Tilim these two mega themes of Sefer Breshit. Avram being chosen to start a nation that will make a name for God, a nation that will sing his praises and talk about him. But the main way we sing God's praises is by how we act, and therefore we have to be a people not only praising God, but those who praise God are obligated to do mishpat and slaka. In light of that. David's going to explain now, or the Mizmor is going to explain, and pray to God to forgive us for our sins. We're asking God to remember us, to remember when he remembers us, or he judges us. Zichr also means to not just to remember. Usually, like in Zichr and on Rosh Hashanah, it means to judge. Okay, So remember your people. When you judge us, judge us with favor. Right? We'd say, like we say in, in Davening, when you remember us, when you judge us, do it to give us salvation. Basically, look at the good side of things. Right? Take into consideration, this is what we talked about in Yalev Yavo on the holidays. Remember, we're asking God that Yalev Yavo, um, that when God judges us on the holidays, or in Rosh Chodesh, and, and the different times of the uh, of the year on our holidays, we want him to remember not only our deeds, but the deeds of our, not the Zichroneinu, but Zichron Avotenu, what our, what our ancestors did, the fact that we dedicated a nation to, we dedicated a city member, Zichron Yushai Mir um, the, the whole the whole concept of Mashiach that we have. We want God to look at the good side of things and take look at the big picture when he considers judging us. Okay. After praying to God for Yeshua, like we do in Shemun Esrei, then we say, Tachnu, Chatanu Yimavotenu, Vevinu Hirshanu. Now, the Mizmor recognizes, even though we're obligated and we ask God to help us, we recognize that we've sinned and we want to do tshuva. Okay. Then we're going to bring examples of how bad we've been. And therefore, don't be surprised in the context of remembering how bad we've been. We're not going to only see how bad we were in the desert. We're going to see how bad we were from the time we left Egypt until the time of the composition of, of Tilim, which is the time of King David. And therefore, we expect to find here something relating to Sefer Shoftim. We're not going to read all chapter 106, but we're going to simply show you the pattern. Again, Avotenu b'Mitzrayim, lo iskilu niflotecha. Remember, the generation coming out of Egypt, we'll see this theme over and over again, didn't appreciate all the great miracles God did for them, which led to the failure of that generation. Lo zechrut rov chasadecha. They didn't remember your kindness. Be'amru al Hashem be'amsuf. Even at Yamsuf, remember, they wanted to go back to Egypt. Even after the 10 plagues, the 10 plagues wasn't enough. At Yamsuf, they saw the Egyptians coming, remember? And they said, weren't there enough graves in Egypt? And again, God saved them. God saved them at Yamsuf. I want to read details. That's going to be the book of Shmo, chapters 13 and 14, and Shirat Yam in 15. Okay? Okay? He dried out the Red Sea. We all know the story. And he led us that through the desert. Okay? That's the story of coming out of Egypt and Kriyat Yamsuf. Okay? Um, tell me if this puzzle looks familiar. How come that pasuk looks so familiar? Someone tell me. That's uh, Shiratayam. That's right. And, and when, about, when do we sing it? It's about Paro itself. When do we sing it? As Yashir. In As Yashir. Before, but no, we have it, but. but um, Remember before Shmon Esrei, we, we say this in Vaitziv and Nachon before Shmon Esrei, don't we? Isn't it some preparation for Shmon Esrei? We quote from Tilim. Yes. Remember Tilod Le'el Yom Golam Baruch Hu Mvorach? 
So we, this is part of our praise. We're quoting from Tilim in that praise. And then and that takes us into uh Shibchugiulim, and that leads us into Shmunasra. Okay. Anyway, Vaiminu Bidvaravi Ashuruti Lato. Um, we reach a good point, remember? Uh, what Pasek is this relating to? The Aminu Vashem Moshe Avdo. And even though we went through Yamsuf right away, Mara, etc. Miru Shachachum Asa Okay. Um, I'm going to take a quick break for a second. Um, I have to fix something. Hold on just for one minute. Um, if you want, I'm going to share the screen and look at the next set of Sukim. Um, let me just pause the Stop the screen for a minute and pause the thing. One second. Okay, there we go. Okay, let me share my screen again. We're again, we're in the middle of Tidlim 106. And um, yeah, it's, we don't want that. We want, actually, we're going to take a look at six and see what we're skipping. Okay, let me share what we're skipping. We did the first several psukim. And then uh, what do we have? Um, we have a whole list of things we did wrong in the desert. Uh, they forgot God. We have um, testing God in the desert, um, asking for the mana. That's uh, that's going to be chapter 11 in Sefer Bamidbar. Um, and then we have Surah Tiftach Aretz of Tivla Datan, Batchas Adat Aviram, a little poetry about Datan Aviram. Batibesh Badatam, again, their punishment. We talk about Cheta Egel. And Chorev, bowing down to them. Bamir with Kvodam. Okay. Uh, we have all the story of Chet Egel. What else is next? God wanted to destroy them. Had Moshe not davened. Lulei Moshe Bechirav. Okay. And that stopped God from getting, from getting angry at them. And then we get to our topic um, of the Chet of the spies. By Masu Beretz Chemda. That's the sin of the spies. They didn't want to enter the land the first generation. Lo Eminu Lidvarov. Never, but Tabar Zetem Amin Bashem Elokechem. Uh, right out of uh, Sefer Devarim, we just read in Parshat Devarim. Okay, uh, they were going to die in the desert. Okay, and then we have Baal Poor, and we'll pick up now in our source sheet from Baal Poor. Now let's stop the share and open up our source sheet. And this is going to take us right into Sefer Shoftim. Let's share my screen again and take a quick look. Okay, what's it say? Um, Perak Lamed. Um, where are we? We are in. Here we are. Pasach Havchet. Vayitzamdu lebal po'or. Right here. They followed the bal po'or. Ve'achlu zivchei metim. That's interesting what they did wrong there. What to mean? Maybe some parshim say that's achila ahladam. Um, what the Torah talks about in Parshat Toshim to you. But basically they got, they got angry in all their ways. And there was a, remember the 24,000 people died. Ve'amod pinchas vayifalel v'teyetzer magifah. Pinchas davened and the magifah sab. Notice we talk about all the bad things we did. And in each case, who was the leader who saved them? Moshe's prayer after Chet Egel. And here, um, Pinchas stopping the plague. Now, just for the fun of it, um, where's this coming from? After Pinchas um, saved the moment, remember? But the Cheshev Lotz Litztaka, the door of the door ad olam. Someone want to suggest where that's coming from? But the Cheshev Lotz Litztaka. What, what's the Mizmor doing here? That sounds like Avraham. And... Abraham Avinu. Exactly. Remember, in what context? But in what context in Bribben Aptarim? Which promise? When God promised, remember? Remember, he says, look at the stars. Right? In the context of... And there's a big machlok at who considered it staka. Did God consider it staka? And here, this is a nice proof that what? The door of the door adolam. What was what was um what was Pinchas's reward? He has a brit kunat olam that his children will be chosen forever. Uh, so therefore, it makes sense that God considered Avram's belief staka, right? It's like he considered um, Pinchas's actions staka, and therefore he rewarded him with children. Okay, so if you look at the parsha name there, this is a very good proof. Uh, at least how Tidim understood those two came. Okay. Then we have the story of Meim Riva. Okay. Remember, we said Moshe didn't sin, but because of the people's behavior, Moshe lost his job of leadership. 
Okay. That's the end of the desert. Now we're finally getting to our topic. Just a little appreciation of Tilim. Now, in light of this, I want to see how it talks about our time period. Isn't that the first topic except for Shoftim? We didn't finish the job. Remember, Lo Harishu, Lo Harishu, Lo Harishu. And that led us astray. Instead of conquering the land, the land conquered us. Um, we got involved with culture of the Canaanites and we learned from their ways. Therefore, what caused Amisra to go astray in the time of the Shoftim? Right? The bad influence of the four nations we didn't get rid of and they influenced us and led us astray. Now we're going to find something we don't see actually detailed in Sefer Shoftim, but it's very harsh here. That was that, that's offering their children, maybe Abu Dhabi, but they offer their children to these gods. Here we see Dam Nakti is referring to not just innocent killing of other people, but offering your children to other gods. And that common, and now we can, if that must have been a very common practice in Canaan, we know that from other other worships, that when something's really important, you sacrificing your own child to God is like total devotion. And therefore, an, our Akeda story is coming to counter that, say God doesn't want something like that. Don't even think about it. That's a topic when you study the Akeda story and why it's in Kumash. Either way, by Tamuba Masehem, by Yisnuba Malem, the Mizmor, the psalm is very harsh on our behavior during the time of the Shoftim. And now here we have the theme here. This is a giveaway. Okay. God became angry at his nation. He's been disgusted, abhorred by the behavior of his nation chosen to serve him, of his nahala, of his inheritance. And therefore, therefore, we lost our enemies and we were under the control of foreign powers. That happened over over again, say for Shavdim, didn't it? Over and over again during the time of the Shoftim, what happened? We were under the role of foreign powers. Right? Many times God came and saved us. And despite that, we continue to rebel against God. Right? And, and we sink low in our, in our sin and our iniquity. Right? God saw when things were bad. He heard our prayer when things were really bad. Then he remembered his covenant and he had mercy on them and forgave them. That's like the, the kindness of God, uh, the multitude of kindness that God had. Now, two things. Isn't that exactly the cycle of Sefer Shoftim? Just in case you forgot the cycle. I'll just put it here on the source sheet. Remember the cycle of Leaving God, we did this many times. All through Sefer Shoftim. We leave God, God brings an enemy. Remember, that was the famous cycle. We cry out to God, and God brings a Moshiach, the Shofet, and then there's quiet, and the cycle returns. You can't miss that this parak in Sefer Tilim is talking exactly about Sefer Shoftim, isn't it? That should be obvious as it could be. So here we see Sefer Shoftim in Tilim 106 in the context of how God, how Good God is to us, in contrast to how bad we were to him. And if God's going to save us, it's for what reason? Because he remembered his brief. We don't deserve to be saved. But, uh, I think we read this week in Parshadikah. Don't think that, um, remember what did we say? When God helps you conquer the land, don't say, It's I'm saving you not because you deserve it, but because of my brief with your forefathers. Now, look at this Pasuk Bebe. Some would tell me why it should look very familiar to everybody. Besides Sefer Shoftim and Sefer Tilim. Anyone know where it's coming from? Why everyone should know that Pasuk? I'll share my screen. I'm at Turk Just tell me, this, doesn't it look familiar? You've seen it before. Not because you read Tilim 106. You've seen it. The ACL or? Um, no, we say there's a certain time of year that we say it quite often. Not all year long, but there's one holiday that it comes up. You mean Zichronot? Exactly. 
We're in Zichronot. Why would it be in Zichronot? That's exactly the theme of Zichronot, isn't it? <laughs> it? It's what now? Remember in Zichronot, we have three psukim from Torah. Three psukim from, remember? Um, we keep, remember, we wrote them by Chatzotrot. We have three psukim from Chomash, three from, 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 from Nevi'im. And three from Tehilim. This is one of the three from Tehilim. Okay? So a little... It's it's almost, it's not that close to Elo. We're six weeks away or so, aren't we? We passed two bob. We're less than six weeks away. From Rosh Hashanah. So a little preparation for Rosh Hashanah. And the Pasuk you're quoting. Now, in the context of that Pasuk is important. What's that mean? That God is willing to forgive us. Right? Even though we've sinned, as long as we recognize that we don't deserve his help, but he's helping us as long as he sees we're going now, at least hopefully in the right direction. Right. Now, now we're going to get to the end of the parak, which is going to lead us into, into 107, which will be even more important for us here. Okay? So again, God saw, this is exactly the cycle of Sefer Shoftim. He saw when things were bad, he heard their cry when we cried out. He remembered his covenant, again, and forgave us with his kindness. And those who captured us, who took over our land, right? He gave us uh, mercy and saved us and sent a Moshiach and saved us from our enemies. Okay. Now, that's what happened up until now. It's the time of King David. Right? We're getting our country together. We still have enemies early in his reign. And what are we asking God to do now? Now, here's a big question. Just ask your local psalm teacher. Is this part of the parak or is this an add-on? You understand my question? Is this from the time of King David? That, that, why doesn't that make sense? Because the time of King David, we've been saved already. Right? Or is this, at the end of the parak, uh, are we quoting the parak, and now we're adding a tefillah at the end of the parak? Now I'm going to share, I'm going to open up the Mizmor itself. There's a passage like I didn't quote, but this is uh, something you should be all familiar with. Anyone who studies Sefer Tidim, if you went to any Beni Gesundheit Shiorim, then you know this very well. At the end of each book, or at the end of each section, see Pasuk Memchet, this is the end of 106. We say these um, between, before Vavarech David, after we finish Tilim 105, and then we quote these Psukim, not all of them, but some of them, from the end of the books. So this is a, not part of the Mismor, this is a concluding line of a whole section. I think this end books, I'm assuming this end, ends book four. That's right. The transfer from book four to book five is right here. And therefore, this Pasuk for sure is a tack-on at the end of the parak. Some people claim that the first line of many Mismorim is a tack-on. Like, um, like many Mismorim, the first line could be the context, not necessarily when it was written. But that, that's all, again, when you take a course in Tilim and you talk about the, but many times you find the opening line and the closing line, not part of the parak. Read all of Rab Samet's books on Tilim. When he organizes the chapters and finds the structure, he always takes that into consideration. Now, if Pasik Memchet is a tack on to the end of the parak, right? What's Pasik Mem Zayn? Does the parak end with Mem Vav? And that's the conclusion that God saves us and we thank him for it. And then we're asking Tfilah, save us again, wherever we are in Jewish history. Or is this part of the original parak? That's a good question, but there's no doubt, in my opinion, that it definitely fits both. <laughs> But it, it's, a, it's a prayer that we add when the Mizmor is over. But remember this line. It's the end of book four. But it's going to be the transition to book five. Remember this line again? Let me go back to my regular source sheet. Where are we here? Here we go. Um, no, I did something wrong. I don't want to log into. That was the wrong share. I think I messed up. I'm having trouble today with my computer. Here we go. Share screen. And we want this one. Sure. Okay. Um, we have this line at the end. Now we take a look at Tidim 107. Again, I'm going to read the last line, or line before the last of Tidim 106. A prayer, Hoshino Hashem Elokeinu, save us and gather us from, from the nations in order to thank you and to praise you. Now, that sounds like a verse written in exile, doesn't it? Because we're asking for Kibbutz Galiot. It doesn't make sense that David's asking for Kibbutz Galiot in this time period. And we're not sent to exile in the time of the time of the Shoftim. We're, we're being punished in our land. 
Therefore, it makes much more sense that this is sort of an add-on. But it's a beautiful transition to the next to 107. Look how 107 begins. 107 is super important for a, a, for a religious Zionist, because this is what we read on Erev Yom Atzmot and Erev Yom Yushalayim. And um, if you're a Hasid, you read this Erev Shabbat. Okay. Look at the opening line of chapter of Tidim 107. That's the same line that we began with 106, isn't it? 106 began with, that's our obligation, but who's worthy? Mishpat and Staka and God's willing to give us another chance. We went through our Jewish history. Now, we're giving another reason to praise God. Who else is obligated to praise God? Am Yisrael is obligated to praise God, but you have to do Tzedek and Mishpat. Now we're going to find another obligation to praise God. Who's obligated? Yomru, in words, this is the command, but who's being commanded? Yomru gulei Hashem asher galam miyatsar miyatsot kibzam miyizrach mirab mitzafon miyam. Okay. This is saying that should Am Yisrael be saved, in other words, should there be kibbutz galiyot, should Am Yisrael be scattered among the nations, and God redeems us and brings us back from the four corners of the earth, it's our obligation to praise God. Now, how you praise God, ask your local rabbi, but this is definitely the source for saying hello and yamatzmot, isn't it? Now, maybe you can fulfill saying hello and yamatzmot by reading this parak, and that's our custom, that's the Rabbanut Paskin when Yom Atzmut first began, and that's why we say this right before Marv, on uh, Erev Yom Atzmut, before Arvid. But it's a definitely fitting parak for Yom Atzmut. I think we probably gave us, I'm sure we've even shown this before. I want to do this in the context of our Sefer, of our Sefer, um, of Sefer Shoftim. But now you understand why the last Pasuk of 106 is a transition to 107. Understand? If this is a prayer in exile, Remember, we get the finishing touches of Tidim in the beginning of Bayesheni. If we're asking God, save us, right? And bring us in from our exiles. In other words, if you do Gulag, we're trying to give God a reason. Why should save us even though we're not deserving? Because if you save us from, if we pray to you and you answer our prayers and we save you, it'll make your name great. We say this every day in Shemun What do we ask God to do? And before we ask for Gulag Shemun we do Shevach, we praise God before our Bakasha. And the first blessing, we remind God, you promised Avram Avinu, which is an eternal breed, Magen Abraham. But what do we say? Okay. What's the logic? You listened, you gave redemption to our ancestors, you saved them, and you can bring Gula, to their offspring, which is us. For what reason? Laman Shmo. For the sake of your name. That only makes sense if what? If God indeed does redeem us, we'll acknowledge that and thank him for it. So if God sees that we're ready and eager to praise him for redemption, that's a reason for God to bring redemption, even though we might not be deserving. So therefore, if you say this with Kavana, with Havana, not just Kavana, if you understand what you're saying, with Shmonesra, should God bring redemption, it's our obligation to praise him for it. So we have a national obligation to praise God, but we'll see in a minute there's also individual obligations to praise God. Okay. Then the Mizmor continues. We're not going to do the whole Mizmor, but we want to get its, its context. Okay, This is the famous uh, four cases, which we'll, I'm sure you're familiar with. Someone lost in the desert. Okay? They can't find their way, no GPS, nothing to drink. They're, they're hungry, they're thirsty. Okay? They're about to die. And in their thirst, they're lost in the desert, by Tzaku al Salam, they cry out to God. And God can save them from their trouble. And then by Yerchem B'derach Yishara, God will lead them in the straight path to find the 7-Eleven or to find the way back to their city. And then what do they need to do? Yodul Hashem Chazdov, Yifu Tav Givni Adam. And now what we're going to do is review this chapter, which I'm sure we studied before, but now in the context of Sefer Shoftim. And now I'm not translating it because I need to show you the, the structure. Okay? This is a parak that if you don't study the structure, you will, you'll never cop how important it is. Okay. What do we see in this para? We have the first three lines as the opener. It's a general statement. Who's obligated? Not only who should, but who's obligated to praise God? Okay. Those who are brought back from exile or anyone saved from any tsar. Asher galam me at tsar. Anyone who's in trouble, God saves them. This will be followed by four examples of someone, an individual or a group, a small group, being saved in times of trouble, where they turn to God in their trouble, 
God hears their cry and they're obligated to thank them. So what's the first case? These are famous. Remember, this is, I'll, let's go right to the end of the source sheet. Um, if you know Birchat Tagona, remember four people have to do Birchat Tagona, Mesechat Brachot, Daf Nun Dalet, Amar Abihud Amarav, Arbat Sichim Dodot, four people have to bring a Korban Toda, have to thank God, which we do Birchat Tagona, Yudayayam, people crossing the sea, okay, Hochi, people traveling through the desert, okay, someone sick who got out of the hospital and uh, got better, and someone who was in jail and uh, got out of jail. Now, What's the source of this Gemara? You can't miss it. These are the four cases here of, of, um, of Tilim 107. So let's take a quick look at them again. Let's look at the parak. It's nice and simple. Let me make it smaller, the source sheet. One second. Okay, just look at the structure. Case number one, I'm sorry, that's case number two. Case number one is people lost in the desert. Okay, The second case is someone in jail, and why? Because they've done something wrong and um, they went against God. That's why they ended up in jail. God was behind it. And then they, in their jail sentence, in their suffering, they cry out to God, they submit to God, and then they cry out to God, and God can break down their, their shackles. And should they get out of jail, they have to thank God. Why? Because he broke down the metal doors of their jail. And open up the locks. Now, um, again, preparation for the holidays. How come this should look familiar? This Pusik here. Someone remember saying this Pusik once a year? Come on, Kaparot. 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 Exactly. That's the Pusik we say before Kaparot on Erev Yom Kippur. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Um, okay, yeah, I have to share. There we go. Um, so that makes sense now why we say that in Erev Yom Kippur, because the whole context is one of Shuva. And if you look carefully again at the Pasuk, why do we think of all of them? This one for Yom Kippur. If you look at the, at the, um, at the second line, you know, those sitting in darkness, basically people in jail. Why are they in jail? They've been punished because they've gone against God. And therefore, what do they need to do? They have to submit to God. They have to do tshuva. Okay? And therefore, that's what we do on the Yom Kippur as well. And therefore, it's a very fitting pasuk for, for um, Kaparot. Okay. Now, let's get back to our structure. Okay, What's the next case? Um, that's someone who's deathly ill. Can you eat anything? They're about to die. What do they do? They cry out to God from their hospital bed. God saves them again. And then we use this Lushan in our prayers. Okay. God sends his word and they're healed and they're saved from their falling apart. And what do they need to do? Again, they have to recognize and acknowledge and thank God, recognize his miracle. And the next line is key to why we bring a Korban Toda or make Birchat Agomel. Because what's the next line? You have to bring a Toda offering and publicly tell people about their salvation uh, with, with happiness. Now, if you remember Korban Toda in Chomesh, in Sefer Baikra, um, there's a regular Shamim and then there's a Korban Toda. A Korban Toda has to be eaten within a day before sunset. You have less than a couple hours to eat it. It comes with 40 loaves of bread. And they're not allowed to have leftovers. And therefore, uh, what basically is going to happen if you bring a korban toda, you're forced to share this korban. It can only be in your shalim. You're limited to where it can be eaten and how much time you have to eat it. Therefore, there's no way one person can do this. Therefore, he's basically forced to share it with other people. And then when you're basically dedicating this kiddush, everyone's going to ask you, why are you bringing a korban toda? And you explain the story. And that's the background to Birchat HaGomel. And that's a, the main source that, and if, and if it applies to this case, this is a binyan av, it applies to all four cases. Then your day yambo niyot, people going lost at sea, hemuroma Hashem, etc. They're lost at sea, about to die, they cry out to God, like in Yonah, God brings, uh, puts, puts the sea quiet, and then they have to thank God, Yudu Hashem Chazdo, Vyamu, Bikalam, Vyamu Shabbos, Kedim Yihadlu. Okay. Then this is, yeah, go ahead. 
It's the acronym, it's my name, Chaim. Ah, very good. Yam, Chole Yam Yusuri Midbar. Uh, so you say that at the end of Shmon Esrei? <laughs> that, Just saying. That minute, right? At the end of Shmon Esrei to say something. <laughs> yeah. Very, very good. Okay. Um, so these, we'll talk about these four cases in a minute. Then we have general redemption. And this is why it's so fitting for Yom Atzmod. God can take rivers and turn them into a desert. And he can take um, sources of water and make them dry. Or he can take a salty land, okay, and because of what he called. Um, I mean, he can take make a land salty. He can take a fruitful land. Was, he can take a place like stone that was like Gan Hashem, was full of river and water, and turn it dry like a desert and turn it salty. That's the story of stone, basically. On the flip side, God can take a desert like the Negev and turn it into a source of water, a dry land, like, like it was full of swamps, bring it back to life again. And he can take hungry people and they can build Moshavim, they can build settlements, etc., and they can plant fields. And now you understand why we read this on Yom Atzvaot, because basically this isn't just a psalm, it's almost prophecy of what happened in our own time period, or last hundred years or so. And then the final line, Yerusham Yismachum, people should see this and be happy, and who's wise and keeps in mind all these things and be bonain to perceive the ways of God or God's kindness in Jewish history. So we have personal redemption followed by national redemption. Now, this is a, a famous parak, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Why are we doing it today? Because the author of this parak, this why, even though it sounds like Kibbutz Galuyot, the core section relates to the theme of Sefer Shoftim. Why? I want to explain why it's so meaningful in light of Sefer Shoftim. Because what's the message of Sefer Shoftim? In Sefer Shoftim, what do we find? Remember the cycle of Sefer Shoftim we talked about over and over again of crying out to God. I'm Israel leaving God. God brings trouble on purpose as a wake-up call. We cry out to God and God brings salvation. And we see that pattern in all these four cases. Remember, every four case, each of the four cases begins with a Sara, remember? Followed by a Saka, followed by Yeshua, followed by Hodaya. And you can see in this on the source sheet, how the pattern repeats itself. Now, it's very similar to the pattern of Sefer Shoftim, but someone tell me what's the main difference between this cycle and Sefer Shoftim? Because uh, here we here we here we see Toda that yeah, they are was, recognizing, and we do not see it in Sefer Shoftim at all. And, but, and what do we see in Sefer Shoftim? Just the crying. Right answer. Check it. <laughs> we don't see anything. We don't yeah, see anything. Now we don't see anything. You just, it's repeated every time by, by Tishkot Aretz. There's quiet. And therefore, no one capitalizes on, on the tshuva. Got it? As soon as God gives tshuva and brings Yeshua and their salvation, we go back, we go back to normal. What's going to change? And that's why, that's why this is the introduction to Sefer Shmuel. Why? Because the first shofet who takes the people's um, salvation and, and, and introspection and turns it into a true repentance movement, a true tshuva movement, that was chapter 7 in the book of Shmuel. Remember? That was our topic last week. Shmuel was not just a, a Levi or a Kohen, he was a Shofet. In what way? He brought Yeshua, he brought redemption, but the main thing is he was a leader and he took advantage of the people's tshuva instead of leaving it with quiet, no more trouble if people go back to normal. No, he's going to gather the people in mitzvah Remember, after they lose, the road is taken captive. He's going to gather people in Mitzvah and get the people back to do tshuva. Now, my claim is, is that um, if this Mizmor originates in the time period of King David, if King David, Rebbe, is Shmuel, the Navi, right? And we prove that Shmuel is the author of Sefer Shoftim. So here we find a beautiful example. Shmuel, the author of Sefer Shoftim, explains on the one hand why what why king having a king is not enough remember that no it's not king it's not going to solve your problems the people want a king because of all the trouble shmuel's whole point is the reason for the trouble is leaving god and you have to do proper tshuva and, and but shmuel thinks you don't need a king god says you do need a king to do what to make sure the people when they do have redemption and they do have salvation he leads them to do proper tshuva and that's exactly what Shmuel begins doing, and that's what David wants to do with his with, with his Yeshua. Meaning, 
David's going to be a student of Shmuel. Now, Shmuel is his Rebbe, who anoints him. He reads Shmuel's famous book, Sefer Shoftim, sees the pattern, and notices the theme of everything ends with Sheket. And how's David going to fix that? He's going to have a time period of Yeshua, and David's going to take his Yeshua, instead of Yeshua leading to Sheket, his Yeshua is going to lead to Hodul Hashem Kiru Bishmo. And his choir in Yerushalayim, bringing the Aron to Yerushalayim, and getting Israel on its feet, and at the center of our national growth will be a Beit HaMikdash, praising God, recognizing God, and doing Tzedek Mishpat. That's fundamental. That was the first leader who finally gets it right, who takes his political leadership and, and God's salvation and uses it on a national level to get the people back in the right direction to be a nation, not serving other gods, but serving our God properly by leading a nation. Remember, we saw the Pesukim of David doing Tzedek Mishpat for his whole nation. We can see the same altar when we study Tzedek Mishpat in detail. If I understand what makes David Mashiach, what makes him the quintessential, whatever the word is, uh, Messiah, it makes it to Shmon What's the pattern? That's Jewish, that's ideal Jewish leadership. So we talk about Mashiach Beit David, or Mashiach, or Mashiach David, or Tzemach David, comes up later in Shmon It's leadership that leads the people, not just to keep halacha, but to take our political leadership, our national strength, salvation, successful army, successful economy, and use that and lead the people and guide them to take that, that success and the, the present and the, the way we thank God is, again, not just by saying thank you, but acting thank you and applying that to our national existence. And that's where David becomes a great example of that. Okay, now, one last uh, parak and tilim. I want to take a look at 78 again. We did this before Pesach in a different context. Um, let me go back to my share screen. And Tidim 78. There's our source sheet. Our source sheet is here. Okay. Um, now we have the background too. In 78, again, I was just reviewed the opening lines, which are famous. Very harsh, but it's all the theme of Shira Tazinu, which is don't blame God when things go wrong, blame yourselves. He talks about, I'm going to sing with you with parables, etc. I'm going to tell you stories. And we heard these stories from our parents. Notice our parents told us the stories of the Torah about all the things God did for us. We can't hide the stories from our children to the next generation. Remember the Dora Haron? We talk about all the great things that God did for us, all the miracles he did. And he gave us laws as well and warnings. And he gave us the Torah. And he taught us not just the Torah in the desert. He taught us to teach it to our children. So that we teach the next generation. Remember the money do Dora Haron, that being that they do. Yakumu Vistapur, leave the hem. Each generation has to teach the next generation both the stories of Chumash and the laws of Chumash. And here's the big line. Be asimu be'lim kislam. Hopefully, through that transmission of tradition from one generation to the next, the stories and the laws, okay, they'll put their hope and faith in God. They won't forget the ways of God. And that will motivate them to keep his mitzvot. Mitzvot tabin saru. And the main message again, which was our whole background to stu our study of Tilim, that's why we did this. I mean, our background to studying Navi. This was the theme of Navim, I explained. They shouldn't be like the first generation coming out of Egypt, a generation that went astray, not a bent Soramora, but a Dor Soramora, a rebellious generation, a generation that God was willing and began to redeem, but they were not ready for redemption. A generation that wasn't ready for redemption and wasn't steadfast in their spirit. Basically, God did things for them, hoping that would bring redemption. It didn't work. Now, then we then he went to he went through, and that means more we're skipping now the main part. That's goes through all the stories of um Yitzhak Mitzrayim and the generation that witnessed all the great miracles, and we have all the ten plagues there. That's why it was a Pesach topic. That was the Mismor that had um the four and five plagues for every plague being four or five. Um, but we did that in detail before Pesach. We get to the last peg. We talk about the story of Yitzhak Mitzrayim. And then we skip all through the rest of Chomesh and we get right to Tanakh. Okay, the people continue to travel after Har Sinai. And he leads them like a shepherd, right? Like sheep through the shepherd in the desert. Okay. 
Betovim Kisahayam. Okay, I'm sorry, this is the story of what he called Kriyat Yamsuf, my mistake. Okay. He takes him to the desert and saves him from Kriyat Yamsuf. And here's where we get to Israel. We're going right from Kriyat Yamsuf right to Israel. By You can see the effect of Shertazinu in the background. This means more. Okay, now we're we finished Chumash now. We're in Sefer Yoshua. Okay, let's listen carefully. Remember the context of this means more. What did we learn from Chumash? We learned not to repeat the mistakes of our ancestors and to appreciate God's involvement in our history. Okay, by Garish Mubnehem Goyim, that's Sefer Yoshua. He got rid of, he drove out our enemies, the, the other nations. That's the second half of Yoshua. Every Shevet got their portion. By Ashkein Bohalem Shifte Yisrael, all the tribes got their portion. That's Sefer Yoshua without a doubt. Now here we see Sefer Shoftim. Pasuk Nunvav. By Nasu Vayamru et Elohim Elyon, Vedotav Lo Shamaru. Right? They kept on testing God and rebelling against God, the God, the, the mighty God above, okay? and they didn't keep his laws. Okay? They go astray again. Um, he said treacherous. The Gidas is, um, is um, I forget what Gidas in English, um, a bogade. Treason. A, a treason, yeah. Treason. So treason is against God. And therefore, they lost their battles. That's Sefer Shoftim, isn't it? We start losing all of our battles. What happens next? That's again from Shirat Azim, Yachnu Bezidim. Okay? We, God got, we made God angry with us, with all our idol worship that we did, all the high places and the idols. Shamalim Beitabar, by Masma Od Yisrael. God heard, saw what we're doing. He got very angry. We had this word by, in Parsha Bethchanan this week. Remember, Shabilamanchem. God became full of anger. Okay. He was very abhorred with Israel. And now, here we have the first chapters of Sefer Shoftim, of Sefer Shmuel. By Tosh Mishkan Shiloh, he abandoned the Mishkan in Shiloh. Oh, she came by Adam. Okay. His tent, where he allowed himself to dwell among men, the Mishkan in Shiloh, he abandoned it and allowed it to be taken over by the Plishtim. By Tain the Shevi Uzo. Who can tell me what Uzo means? What was taking care of? What's Uzo referring to here? Anybody oh, know? He said the Aron. Yeah, this is the bad translation. I'm sorry. The Aron, give me an example. Okay. We say this in the morning. Um, He's not talking about Uza, the guy who uh, want, was killed, right? Oh, Peretz Uza, okay? okay. Yeah. Atav um, Zecha, give me the Pasek. Atav Aron Zecha. Um, how's the Pasek begin? Um... Remember that line? Yeah. That's referring to the, the Aron. Okay. The Aron is called the God's string when it goes to war. So our, the, the Aron was taken captive. That's the enemy taking the Aron. That's going to be chapters 4, 5, and 6 in, in Sefer in Shmuel Aleph. By Asger Lecher Vamo. His people fell by the sword of Anachtoi Tabar, got, got angry again. See the word Tabar again against his inheritance. And finally, tell me if this sounds familiar. The, the two sons of Eli. Exactly. Hofni, That's yes, okay. And that was the beginning of Sefer Shutim, but we reached rock bottom. And then what happens by the time we get to, to our Sefer Shmuel? Watch how this means more summarizes quickly. The time period of, of Sefer Shmuel. Right? God sort of wakes up from sleeping. All of a sudden, after all of our defeats during the time of the Shoftim, all of a sudden, God begins to help us again. Right? And again, this is the theme of Shirat Azinu. Remember? He felt bad for us. He helped us, even though we might not have been deserving, but he helps us with the hope that We'll do something about it and we'll do proper tshuva. And therefore, by Masbo Yosef, God was abhorred and disappointed with the leadership of Yosef, which is the tent of Yosef, which was Shiloh. It was Shevet Ephraim Lobachar. He took the Mishkan away from Shevet Ephraim. Remember, Shiloh is in the tribe of Ephraim. Remember the tension between Rachel and Leah? He abandoned the children of Rachel and the leadership of Ephraim. 
ויבחר שבט יהודה את הר ציון אשר אהב. Now he chose הר ציון, he chose David, שבט יהודה, and that's going to be the theme that God's choosing of מלכות דוד goes hand in hand with God choosing Yerushalayim, <coughs> which here is referred to as הר ציון, אשר אהב means when God chooses something, it's אהבה, we saw that <coughs> in Sefer Dvarim the last two weeks also, about God loving his people, meaning God choosing them. God chose us to serve him. It was a love decision. Referring to David wanting to build the Mikdash, bringing the Aron and getting the Mikdash ready. Okay? He chose David to become the leader. He took him out from a shepherd. And now he becomes the shepherd who's going to watch God's people. By your aim, Ketom Lavavo, David becomes our shepherd who watches the nation. Okay, with Funot Kapav Yanchem. He'll lead them using his understanding, his Tfuna, his Bina. Um, <coughs> you'll use his Chokma Bina Vedat to lead the people. And notice in the desert, what were we told before earlier in the parak? Who, who, um, when God took us in the desert, remember after, um, Striking the Egyptians by Yachabor Mitzayim and Pasuk Nimbed by Yasek Ketzon Amol by Nagim Keeder by Midbar. God led His people like we were His sheep, and He was our shepherd, leading us through the desert, okay? and He brought us to the land. And now, who's taking over for God? Kibyachol, David and Melech is now leading His people, and He becomes our new shepherd. Hashem Roi Lo Achsar. Remember, it's going to be Tilim, uh, what they call um, Mizmor the David. Hashem Roi Lechem gives to. The, to David, God is his shepherd, and uh, and for God, David is a shepherd of his people. So again, here we see. Um, let me stop the share. Okay, we have to finish now. Um, that was my whole point in Sefer Shmuel is that I'm coming to establish once and for all that David is chosen to become the leader. And here's the Mizmor in the time of King David explaining why God abandoned Shiloh, why he chose Yerushalayim, and that was the big contest in context of. And the strife during the first temple period after the split kingdom, we have to establish is David being chosen? Is that is that what God wanted? And again, when we get back to Sefer Shmuel in our study, we get back to that theme. Remember, my main point I was trying to show you the book was written to explain that despite all the question marks and all the problems, God indeed chose David, um, despite all the reasons why you think he wasn't chosen. And again, when we learn our study of Sefer Shmuel, I said we want to show you today. Several Prakim that we're all familiar with that are in our davening, in our culture, but in the context of this transition from Sefer Shoftim to Sefer Shmuel, we can see it reflected in Tilim from based on the core themes of Chumash, which I think are super meaningful today. Okay, I have any quick questions? I have to leave in a minute. I go catch Mincha. So what? Uh, um, I think we're good. Chat was very quiet today. Okay, I guess it's been a So, in case someone Thank wants you. to. So that okay, everyone have a good week. Next week, I'm going to take a break from textual study, and we're good because it's time for people going on Tiulim, Ben Asmanim. So we're going to take a Tiul, and I hope I don't take away from Shuli, but we'll do a Tanakh Tiul. We're going, to, we're going to study the geography of Israel. I'll try to use my maps as well as possible. We're going to do our study of um, the stories in Shmuel. There's a lot of geography there and topography to explain the stories and our borders. So I'm going to dedicate a share. We'll relate to when the Aron's taken captive in Shiloh, but we'll talk about the topography of Israel and how it relates to um, you know, our borders and how it's going to explain the background to Seber Shmuel and Shoftim and Shmuel and early Malachim. Basically, it'll be a class on geography in the Bible. And that'll be our last class before Elo topics. Then we're going to have topics. Um, we'll talk about Chagay Tishrei. And we'll, I'm, I'm going to finalize with Rabbi Jay the titles. But we're going to take a break from Seber Shmuel and do Elo topics. Because Elo, because we don't have time for Elo topics during in Tishrei, <laughs> because of the schedule, Yantav always comes out on Sunday. So I can do everything ahead of time. And then we'll return to Sefer Shmuel in the middle of October after the Chagimim Mitz Hashem. So everyone have a good week. And, Are uh, you going to include Lebanon? Excuse me? Are you going to include Lebanon, please? Even uh, though we can't go there, it seems to be very crucial to understanding the overall geography. He, especially at the time of David and Shlomo, a, a, tremendously important. It's it's like the key. 
It's the Kli The Kli Tars, our, our, our trade, our trade comes through Lebanon. Everything yeah. comes through Lebanon. All yeah. of the wars go through Lebanon, oh, yeah. back and forth. Everything and all, goes through. All the wood for the base of Mikdash comes from Lebanon. Yeah, but that's 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 on the other side. That's on the seaward side. But the passageway through Lebanon, that passageway is the key to everything that happens from the time of Avraham Avinu and through until the time. Yeah, yeah, you're talking about the Bikat, Bikat the other day. Bikat, Bikat, the, the, that's the border between Lebanon and Syria today. The Bikat, the, the Becca Valley. The, 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 that, the yeah. two mountain ranges in the middle. Yeah. And, and the valley in between. Lebanon Visserion Klo Kmo Ben Reimim. Think about that on Friday night. Okay, yeah, we'll we'll mention that as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ravasher. Have a good week, everybody.